who are the Taliban? What do they stand for? What do they want? Obviously, year by year, this changes. So what is the nature of this organization? Can they be a legitimate, peaceful, kind, respectful uh, government sort of holder of power or, is, or are they fundamentally not capable of doing so? Yeah. I mean, the briefest answer would be that they are a clerical slash military organization. Um, they have, this is kind of a imperfect metaphor, but years ago, a German scholar used the term caravan to describe them. Mm -hmm. And that, that has some attractive elements because different people have joined the Taliban for different purposes at different times. But today, and people tell us, you know, scholars who know more about the movement than I have said, listen, the Taliban is this kind of hodgepodge of different actors and people and competing interests. And I think, so we have a lot of scholars who say, listen, they're, they're, it's polycentric. It's got people in this city and that city and so on. I think actually, I was always very skeptical. You know, how do they know this? I mean, this is an organization that doesn't want you to know um, where that money comes from and so on. But I would say now that we have a clear picture of what has happened, I'd say they were a astoundingly well-organized clerical military organization that has a, a very cohesive and enduring ideology, which is quite idiosyncratic if we zoom out and continue the conversation we're having about Islam and how we think about radicalism and you know who's drawn to what. Um, people throw different terms around to describe the Taliban. Some use a term that links it to a kind of school of thought born in the 19th century in India, the Deobandi school. Uh, but if you look at their teachings, it's very clear now, I think, that these labels, it's like saying, you know, you're an MIT guy. Well, what does that mean? I mean, MIT is home to dozens of different potentially kinds of intellectual orientations, right? I mean, attaching a name of a school doesn't quite capture I mean, it, it's, yeah. it's complicated. I mean, yeah. actually, MIT is interesting because yeah. it's, it's, I would say MIT is different than Stanford, for example. Yeah, I think MIT has a more kind of narrow. Yeah, I hear you. Um, Bad analogy on my part, maybe. <laughs> well, no, it's interesting because I would argue that there's some aspect of a brand like Taliban yeah. or MIT. Yeah, no relation that has a kind of uh, interact like the the brand results in the behavior of the like enforces a kind of behavior on the people and the people yeah, yeah. feed the brand and like there's a loop i think yeah stanford is a good example of something that's more distributed there's sufficient amount of diversity mm. in like all kinds of like centers and all that kind of stuff that the 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 the, the brand doesn't become one thing yeah I mean, mit is so engineering it's yeah so no, I, I think in that Okay, so scratch, <laughs> scratch MIT. Let's scratch Stanford too, because I, I think Stanford's more like MIT than 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 you might imagine. But uh, but isn't Taliban? Yeah. Isn't it pretty? I don't think there's a diversity. So yeah, so like, sorry. So the, just to rephrase, so so people say, oh, the Deobandi school. I'm like, what is that? I mean, but the Taliban are they're an ethnic movement. They represent a vision of Pashtun power, right? The Pashtuns are people who are quite internally diverse, who actually speak multiple dialects of, of Pashto, who reside across the frontier of Pakistan and Afghanistan. There are Pashtuns who live all over the planet, right? There's a community in Moscow, California, everywhere, right? So it's a global diaspora of sorts. Pashtuns have a kind of genealogical imagination so that lots of Pashtuns can tell you the names of their grandparents, great-grandparents, and so on. And that's kind of a, there's a sense of pride in that. Pashto language is a kind of core element of that identity, but it's not universal. So for example, you can meet people who say, I am Pashtun, but I don't know Pashto. So as you as you claw away at this idea, it, it, it's amorphous. It also means different things, different people at different times. So saying the Taliban are, are Pashtun requires lots of qualifiers because lots of Pashtuns will say, no, no, I, I, I have nothing to the Taliban. I hate those people. You know, so the Taliban tried to mobilize other Pashtuns with limited success, but their core membership is almost exclusively Pashtun. And they say, no, no, we represent Afghans. We, re we represent pious Muslims. 
And so in recent two, three years, they've gone further to say, no, we have ethnic, ethnic groups. We have Uzbeks, we have Tajiks, we have Hazaras. And in the north of Afghanistan, in recent years, they did do a bit better at drawing in people who were very disaffected because of the government, and they were able to diversify their ranks somewhat. But if you watch this at August 15 and who they've appointed, what language they've used, how they've presented themselves, it's clear that you know they are Pashtun, they are male, and they are extremely ideologically cohesive and disciplined, I'd say. Right? So I think that a lot of the polycentrism, blah, 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 some of that stuff was a way to fight a war. Um, they, are, they are fundamentally, you know, a guerrilla movement. They see themselves as kind of pious Robin Hoods. The rhetoric is very much about taking from the rich, taking from the privileged, giving to the poor, being on the side of the underdog, fighting against evil. And so, I mean, they're, they're, their bag, if you like, their thing, their, their central theme, their brand is about public morality. And so their origin story, going back to 1994, is that they interceded, they broke up a gang of criminals who were trying to rape people. And so there's a very interesting kind of like emphasis on like sexuality and on on public morality and really being the core of like, you know, we're going to restore order and, yeah. and public morality. And how that translates into governance is something they've never sorted out. I mean, how do you run a banking system? If your intellectual priorities are really about you know, the length of a beard. <laughs> and then and then their path to power in a, in a kind of abstract sense. I mean, a lot of that was very much driven by, um, if you like, propagating the problems of martyrdom. Mm -hmm. And that sounds, I, I don't mean to say that in a way that, to make it sound ridiculous, to make it sound like it's, um, you know, a, a moral judgment. It's simply, I think, a fact. It's a fact of their appeal that they promised young men who have known nothing else but studying in certain schools if at all but they've known fighting and they've known they've known victimization and this isn't a, i'm not asking for like sympathy for them but i think the reality is that a lot of the what we know about the kind of foot soldiers is that they they lost families in bombings um in airstrikes in night raids you know i mean orphans have always been a stream um living in in all-male society uh, not knowing girls, not knowing women, hearing things from outside about places like Kabul, and so there's always been this kind of uh, urban rural dimension. It's not it's not just that, but I think there's a there's a whole imagination that being Taliban captures, mm 